Hi, everybody. It's really thank you very much for um, joining us today. I'd like to thank, first of all, London Middle East Institute uh, Center of Iranian Studies and uh, Aki El Borazi, specifically from ZOAS, for helping us put on this event. Now, um, this is the first in what I hope will be a series of events where we actually look at LGBTQ Iranian lives and experiences. Um, and I think it's quite apt that it's occurring during the History Month in the UK, um, as important aspects of history, provenance, context, content, and time are really pertinent here. Today, we're learning about Iran, where as a nation with a gender neutral language, discussions around the use of the term they change. Um, whilst ideas need redressing, linguistically, no change is required. Likewise, ideas of third and fourth genders, whilst new to Western cultures, have ancient roots in some other parts of the world. And then meanwhile, when we consider the fact that Western LGBTQ studies are only a few decades old, and importantly, highly dynamic, and that includes the language and the terminology. I'm actually saying this as a pretext and an apology on behalf of all of us taking part today in case anyone uses a term that another is in disagreement with. So please let us kindly alert each other, but let us also be aware of the cultural nuances in language and socio-religious uh, structures that mean LGBTQ experiences are as varied as the nations that they occur in. And of course, there is the normal culture, which is highly dynamic and is still being formulated. Now, today we are really lucky that we've got three brilliant uh, scholars from different points of their career joining us. And I'm not going to say too much about what they're going to speak about because you're going to find out shortly. But what we've done is we are going to close the chat during the presentations of our dear friends today. And all your questions, please address in the Q&A section and kindly put the name of the person you'd like to have the question addressed to. Uh, we, unfortunately, as you're aware, especially with the numbers that we have, we may not be able to address all the questions. However, Aki is kindly putting up all the email contacts of our speakers today. At the end of each of their talks, you will get a list of their uh, literature review, uh, literature references, which you may find interesting. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our first speaker. Uh, Zeynab Peram uh, Barzadeh is undertaking a PhD in sociology on untellability of Persian bisexual narratives at the University of uh, Huddersfield in the UK. They are co-founder and board member of Spectrum, a feminist queer organization based in France and a teaching assistant in an online Persian master's program at Iran Academia. So Zainab Jan, if you'd like to take over, please. Hi everyone, thanks for joining us today. And I wanna especially thank uh, my research participant and activists who helped me to do this research and are present here today with us. Uh, I'm going to talk about mononormativity in the Persian speaking LGBT communities. <clears throat> and by non-mononormativity, I mean the normative understanding of sexual orientation in the binary of heterosexual versus gay, which erase other sexual orientations such as bisexuality, pansexuality, polysexuality. And <clears throat> I'm doing this research as a bi-activist because uh, I used to and I still do that. Uh, I encourage people to talk about their bisexuality, but I realized that it is hard to talk about bisexuality in the Persian context and also to understand it. So I try to understand why this happened. So uh, my main claim is that uh, any uh, a story about sexual orientation in post-revolutionary Iran 
is often shaped around the idea of discovering the real gay and also uh, realize if that person deserves to be protected. That happened because of uh, the fact that a lot of people had to seek asylum based on their sexual orientation. And uh, because of that, we can see that uh, stories are told to and by uh, different people in the field, uh, including um, asylum seekers, activists who support them, their interpreters, case officers, and even when reporters and researchers talk about sexual orientation, they often have to uh, uh, do their research or their reports about uh, asylum seekers because they are the most accessible group for any research about sexual orientation uh, among Iranians. And on cyberspace is also a lot of discussions on social media are often around uh, the fact of uh, supporting asylum seekers. And um, I uh, decided to focus on bisexual asylum seekers as, an, uh, as a bisexual immigrant uh, who has had the privilege of not uh, being forced to seek asylum. So this research is trying to fill the gap between different area of studies uh, sexual orientation and gender identity uh, studies about Iran, which has uh, often neglected uh, bisexuality, sexual orientation and gender identity based asylum, which also does not consider bisexuality bias studies, which is often uh, only about people uh, who live in their own country, intimate citizenship, which also does not consider uh, immigrants and asylum seekers. And even when we uh, talk about uh, stateless uh, studies, it's often about, uh, not about uh, sexuality. And by intimate citizenship, I mean uh, the discussion about a right uh, to intimate uh, part of our life. I will discuss that later. So um, the mo uh, sexual stories in the asylum process are being told and retold several times. But the main uh, occasion that these uh, stories are uh, being told uh, are when um, asylum seekers tell it to the case officers with the support of their allies who are other asylum seekers and um, also uh, activists. So I use uh, a framework designed by Plummer, uh, which uh, discuss uh, any occasion of telling a story based on um, uh, who is telling the story with whose advice and uh, who is the reader, who is the audience. And uh, based on a Plummer uh, framework, I use a specific framework to analyze the context that, as, uh, that uh, stories are being told and understood. In this interactive narrative analysis approach, uh, I uh, analyze context in three different levels. In uh, intersubjective level, I focus on language, intention, conscious, and unconscious choices that people make in telling their stories. The social field, uh, which focus on historical events. Uh, 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 social groups, uh, structures, and institutions in relation to identities, social uh, networks, emotions, motivations, and in meta narrative level, I focus on the local and universal meaning systems and concepts that are behind uh, any um, a storytelling. And uh, to collect my data, I have used two different techniques. I have interviewed asylum seekers and activists. 
but I only uh, I did not only uh, interviewed bisexuals, but I also interviewed monosexuals. By monosexuals, I mean gay, lesbian, and heterosexual trans asylum seekers. And I made this decision not only because it is hard to find bisexual asylum seekers, but also because, as I said, um, stories are shaped in interaction between people, so it is important to consider all of those people who are involved in the process as a stakeholders. And uh, I will also refer to online and offline participant observation of Persian public uh, SOGI debates that I have been involved in it, uh, both as a researcher and activist for several years. So uh, in analyzing the asylum stories, I consider different stages of asylum. Uh, the past life of asylum seekers in Iran, the asylum process itself, their living uh, condition in Turkey as a transitory country, and also their possible future after resettlement in a third country, which is often either US, uh, Canada, or Australia, and more recently, some European countries, especially Spain. So by analyzing those interviews, uh, I uh, concluded that asylum seekers learn about uh, SOGI from their family members, friends, health providers, and media and cyber spaces. They have joined online and offline LGBT communities. Uh, and uh, the information that they have uh, find have been in different languages in Persian, Turkish, and English. And uh, even when they were not familiar enough with English, they have tried uh, to use different uh, strategy to be able to access that uh, information, even sometimes using Google Translator. And uh, they also uh, tend to use English terminologies more than Persian ones. And they also trust English sources more than uh, the Persian ones. They have also faced and witnessed uh, online and offline biphobia, regardless of their own sexual orientation. So when uh, I talk about biphobia in the community, I mean different negative at uh, attitude that people have in the community. The first one is uh, that bisexuals are hypersexual. Ramtin, a gay man activist says, this is a very common idea that bisexual individuals can have orgasm wherever they want. Their emotional dimensions are not considered at all. Bisexuals are also considered as cheaters. Ahura, a bi man says, I'm always adopted and humiliated by my partner. My partner think that uh, I'm in a relationship with a girl all the time. And this is very hard. And my partner does not uh, like me to uh, have a female friend. Another form of biphobia is that uh, bisexuals uh, bisexuality is not seen as a sexual orientation. Shaya, a trans woman who used to identify as gay for a while, remembers, it seemed that people were divided to two groups. Some seemed to be people outside that community who were hetero and the rest of us who used to say that we are gay. Bisexual was not a word, so we did not used to talk about it. Uh, there is also this assumption that everyone is bisexual but can choose to become a straight. Saman, a heterosexual trans man, justify that idea this way. I say maybe it's because of banning sexual relationship with the opposite sex. It is banned here in Turkey as well. This is a very common stereotype in the cyber spaces as well that I will discuss it later. Another biphobic attitude is that bisexuality is just a phase. Robin, a bi man, has been told uh, several times, you would like to have a relationship once or maximum two wise. You will leave and you will seek the other one, the other sex. You don't get attached. But Robin emphasized that he can be really deeply attached to his partners. And, um, also, bisexuals are not accepted as a part of LGBT community. Sorena, a heterosexual trans woman, remembers. 
Bisexuals were closer to us, but not one of us. This feeling was there, but we were very comfortable with them. They were very present in our community, had an active presence and really liked to be integrated into the society, really liked to be accepted. <laughs> But what is uh, the impact of that by phobia on bisexual people? It's by invisibility, which happens in different ways. First of all, uh, sometimes bisexuals uh, cannot discover their sexual orientation. Fariman, a bi plus queer person who used to identify as heterosexual trans man says, if I knew that sexual orientation is a spectrum, maybe I would search more. Another impact of uh, that is uh, bisexuals cannot find a role model for themselves. Mona, a bisexual woman says, no one used to officialize it. I mean, I don't remember that anyone has emphasized that, for example, they are bisexual or you can be bisexual. And yeah, by a cis person, I mean a person who identify with the same gender as they have been assigned at best. And at the end, bisexuals have to hide themselves. Robin, a bi cis man who used to introduce himself as gay says, I used to feel that this way they will accept me more compared with a bisexual because they used to keep a distance from me. But there is another form of biphobia, which is resulted directly from asylum process. Some asylum seekers uh, claim uh, that uh, bisexuality has been misused uh, by asylum seekers. Ali, a queer person says, if we were in an open society in a European country, where there was no ban for any sexual orientation, it wouldn't be a problem for me. But in this asylum context, bisexuality has been misused. Someone, a trans heterosexual man also says, authorities have heard a lot of lies. Asylum seekers presented themselves in the name of bisexual, bisexual, bisexual to the extent that they ruined the situations for others. For example, Many bisexual cases take longer, many are not uh, believed, many get picked up. So uh, my um, result confirmed the previous studies which has been uh, done based on uh, asylum cases uh, that uh, I have discussed it in my uh, book chapter that you can find online that uh, bisexual asylum seekers tend to be rejected more than gay and lesbian asylum seekers because bisexuals are erased from country of origin information documents, which are very important document when asylum cases are assessed and also because bisexual asylum seekers or their interpreters are not familiar with the terms and definitions used to describe bisexuality. And also because asylum authorities expect asylum seekers to choose uh, between heterosexual or gay. And as a result, uh, bisexual asylum seekers are invisible in the asylum process. The percentage of bisexual asylum seekers among the LGBT asylum seekers is very low, sometimes almost zero because asylum activists and other asylum seekers advise them to seek asylum as gay or lesbian. Uh, as I said, I have analyzed cyber spaces as well. These cyber spaces are important uh, to understand the context because they are the platforms that people find resources about sexual orientation and gender identity. They find other LGBTQ individuals. They can come out or tell their anonymous stories and they can also organize for collective actions, for example, by using hashtags and cyber storms. 
we can recognize two different debates uh, in social media and also generally in uh, LGBT uh, Q communities. An older debate is between the concept of Hamjens boss or same sex player, which is a very offensive um, uh, word and it's often used by people who are LGBT phobic and Hamjens Gara, which is considered to be a more acceptable and respectable one, and it can be translated as a homosexual. But there is a newer debate. Uh, again, by using Hamjens boss or same sex player, but this time against uh, bisexuals or Dojens Gara in Persian. And this is uh, often used by uh, gay people who claim that they are not the Hamjens boss, the same sex player, the perverted one, but bisexuals are that pervert group and uh, they try to defend themselves in this way. But uh, where these concepts are coming from? Uh, diaspora activists suggested to use Hamjens Gara in a state of Hamjens Buzz in 1994 in Huma magazine, which is considered to be the first uh, Persian gay magazine. This happened while in many languages, activists suggested to use gay as an identity in a state of homosexual as a pathologized concept since 1960s. Defining Hamjens was in contrast to Hamjens Gara can be compared with defining homosexual in contrast to pseudo-homosexual by psychologists in the global north in the middle of 20th century when they were analyzing gender segregated uh, contexts such as prison and military services. But why all of these discussions are important? I want to come back to the concept of intimate citizenship that uh, I mentioned at the beginning. Intimate citizenship is about our right to choose what we want to do with our bodies, our feelings, our identities, our relationships, gender, eroticism, and representations. But bisexual citizens are excluded from uh, discussions on intimate uh, rights because of heteronormativity, but also because of mononormativity. And it is also important to consider that uh, LGBTQ asylum seekers' rights, including their intimate rights, are neglected in any discussion about uh, citizenship because they are stateless. So in a broader context, in the international level, we can talk about international norm uh, polarization. Uh, uh, that on the one hand, there are uh, civil society activists, a state and media who talks about sexual right as human right. And then on the other hand, there are uh, again, civil society activists, a state and media who talks about traditional values. And both of uh, these groups are, are under impact of globalization and uh, both of these approach and discourses are universal approaches. I want to conclude that by phobia and by erasure in the Persian speaking community is under influence of by phobia in the English pop culture and media and social media because they are the resources that shape our understanding of sexual orientation. And also on the impact of academic studies and human rights reports in the global north because they shape the country of origin information documents that asylum cases are assessed uh, based on that. And the asylum process itself uh, is very important because it uh, forced people to perform a specific form of gayness and refugeeness to be able to get uh, asylum. In uh, such a context, uh, Persian bias stories are not tellable and if told are not heard, understood and recognized. Thanks for listening.
Thank you very, very much for that. And thank you for keeping so in time, uh, Zainab Jan. Um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, as I said before, please, all your questions addressed to the person you'd like to ask it from in the Q&A. Next, we're going to move on to Bahar Azadi. Now, I might add here that it's because of many hours spent having listened to gender issues from Bahar that part of the reason that we've got this whole uh, LGBTQ Iran series going on. Dr. Arzadi received her doctorate in philosophy from University of Paris, Descartes Sorbonne. She's currently part time researcher at the Faculty of Medicine Bichat and postdoctoral fellow at the University of Paris, Mont Sorbonne. Her postdoctoral research is on female genital mutilation in France, but a large body of her work and her PhD was on transsexual studies in Iran. Thank you, Baharajan. I hand over to you. Okay, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm delighted to be here today to present you briefly a short presentation of my research that I've done for my PhD two years ago on transgender identities in contemporary Iran after the Islamic Revolution of 1979. This beautiful uh, picture was shot by my dear friend Tahmine Monzavi, in which you can see Tina a trans woman who has passed away, unfortunately, one year ago in February. And I'm in memory of our dear Tina, I wanted to put her beautiful picture here. So let me start with um, notions and terms. Uh, abbreviation trans or transgender is an umbrella term covering people whose gender identity is different from the gender assigned to them at birth. Trans people may desire or not to undergo sexual reassignment surgery and medical assistance to transition. Trans people, like anyone else, could be non-binary, gender fluid, or binary, and also after transition or before transition, they can also be non-monosexual or monosexual. Most of the people that I met uh, for my interviews identified themselves as trans, transsexual, or TS. But as you can see, there are some terms that have been translated in Farsi as sex change surgery, sex change, gender confirmation, gender affirmation, or and as you can see, there is a changing from sex change surgery to gender affirmation. But as I said, most of the trans people that I met identified themselves simply as trans, TS, or transsexual. DSM or ICD-11 are both two uh, important reference that not only in Iran, but in all countries that a trans person is, uh, um, should pass by a protocol of medical legal uh, sexual reassignment surgery. So all of these countries are based, are, are reference to a diagnostic and statistical manual of mental disorder. In Iran, we are still based to uh, version five of this uh, manual in which seeking, the seeking of medical and surgical help is a symptom of gender dysphoria. However, we can see a very optimistic changing, for example, for WHO that approved recently that uh, in its global manual of diagnostic, they have put gender incongruence from the mental and behavior disorder to a chapter name condition, uh, to a chapter related to conditions related to sexual health. But as I uh, mentioned, in Iran, we are still in a DSM-5 that seeking of medical and surgical help is a symptom of gender dysphoria or malole genciati or ekhtalale hoviyate genciati as gender identity disorder. So my questions, arguments, and method, as my time is really brief here, uh, I don't talk about my theoretical approach that I use in my PhD, but I was really influenced by Foucauldian approach about power, knowledge, and subject, and the discourse analysis and discourse criticism. So uh, my method was completely qualitative analysis. I did in-depth interview with trans people, group interview, also with, uh, with all institutional persons that they are engaged in this protocol of sexual reassignment surgery. 
I also did some online interview and observation that I will uh, explain you later. As Afsana Najbomadi, as a historian, um, show us in her great works, uh, the history of gender transition in Iran begins in, in, uh, in 1940s. And in 1960s, we can see that a lot of terms like sex and gender determination, notions of gender disorder or hormonal or genetical are, uh, have been translated largely from American psychiatric literature to Iranian language. The other part is the history of uh, Ayatollah Khomeini's fatwa in 1967, uh, when he was exiled in Najaf. And at this time in Tahrir al wasiya in a um, series of his books, he uh, legalized the sexual reassignment surgery for intersex people. In 1973, the first uh, reported have been reported, the, the first sex change for non-intersex people have been reported in the media. And then when Khomeini became uh, not uh, a leader of Islamic Republic as, and he gained the, not only as a religious authority, but as a political authority, his fatwa gained support, finance and force of love. So uh, when we talk about Khomeini and his fatwa, surely we talk about Maryam Khatuna Mulkara, who is a spiritual mother for trans people in Iran, who met Khomeini in person, and it was the first person that, they, that got the, uh, the fatwa of uh, Ayatollah Khomeini. Mulkara sent the letters to Khomeini, and every time Khomeini thought that she's an intersex and referred her to his fatwa. But when he saw her uh, in Iran in 1986, it was the time that Khomeini understood what is the difference between an intersex and a, and a trans woman like uh, uh, Maryam Khatuna Mulkara. And as you can see in the translation of the fatwa, Khomeini said that sex reassignment surgery is not prohibited in Sharia law if reliable medical doctor recommend it. In this fatwa, we can, we, there isn't any obligation for trans people to undergoing sexual reassignment surgery. However, what is a conditional and what is very important is the medical uh, diagnostic of being trans. Um, so the Islamic Sharia taught, institutionalized by the totalitarian state of Iran has an open perception and we can all the time criticizing this openness. What are the principles that in this Shia taught have been taken to legalize this, um, this gender transition or this gender identification. Uh, if you are really interested, I recommend you to read the works of Alipur or the work of Karimina. And uh, but I just um, put some uh, some of these um, principles, like for example, necessity over prohibition is a guiding principle in Islamic medical ethics. It means that when you are in a situation of hardship. Uh, uh, this hardship is a necessity. So, it, so a trans person, because he or she suffer from this situation, is in a situation of necessity, and, and this person can over its prohibition. Principle of permissibility is that everything or act that isn't clearly forbidden haram is halal. I think is, it is the one of the most important principles that Ayatollah Khomeini uh, took, and because we don't find anything as haram in Sharia law, so it's halal. The principle of dominant, uh, which is very a nice principle, I, I find it really nice, but all the time is limited in its limitation, is that everybody had a right to or control over his or her body and property. And the transformation of adjectives and characters of creators do not change the essence of divine creation. So as I told you, in Iran, passing by a sex reassignment bureaucracy or medical, medical legal sex change protocol is obligatory. It starts normally by a psychiatric assessment, but for other, other trans people told me that they start they, they processes by a judge, by a, an authorization of a judge in a familiar court. So trans people are really uh, between these two big institutions of psychiatric assessment, medical assessment, and the other parts is the law and what is regarding law in, in, the, in this country. So these processes is not as simple as you can see. Sometimes they are the years and, yet, and the years in this labyrinth uh, institutionals, and sometimes they are referred back. And what is important that in, in this protocol, mandatory sterilization uh, is uh, so very important and not only mandatory sterilization, mandatory reconstructing, sex reconstruction after the sterilization. 
So a trans person, as I told you, my thesis was about the subjectivities, the process of identification. A trans person, not only in Iran, in other, in, I think in every country, in every society, is, a, is in a bigger layer of gender normativity. This gender normativity in some countries like Iran is highly binary, and everybody knows it. And in some other countries is, is less, uh, it could be less binary or however the, the voice of uh, activism is more, uh, more here. But in this gender normativity, uh, as is uh, produced and reproduced by religion, citizen, uh, citizenship, love, family, school, love, job, everything. So this process of identification starts in this space. And then is institutionalization. In, uh, as the work of uh, Zara Said Zadeh shows us, and it's very interesting, that trans, uh, trans subject in Iran is mostly a subject of medicine. And that's why I told you that we are completely stuck in a paradigm of pathologization. Even though the sexual reassignment surgery have been legalized, but um, trans person, they didn't got the recognition in law. We can find other, the other discourses in this institutionalization, like who is a real trans, who is a fake trans, who, is a, who will become a proper woman and proper man. And we have also the, the voice of transgender activism outside and inside Iran. And all of these so influenced to these identifications and surely it is interactive. Trans person as a subject also uh, influence to these different layers. I put some names, they are not, I didn't want it to label trans people, but what I labeled is their reactions, it's their uh, process of identification. They are sometimes disciplined, very happy and good in this binary and in, in this protocol proposed to them uh, in Iran. They, they could be non-binary, they could be gender nomad, and they become the outsiders of this institutionalization of the request in Iran. They can be regretters, but not only regretters because they didn't, they, they wasn't real trans, but because of the, the, for example, the quality of their surgeries, because they were forced to do surgery in the limited time of two years to gain their identity. We have a strategies. This means that they are someone that really seek this identification, but they are the outsider of this institution. So to shed light, um, to these different experience and uh, strategies, I, I've chosen uh, some uh, quotes from my research and I will uh, read for you. I went to Ruzba hospital three times. They tried to dissuade me from having an operation and asked me to come with my husband. I was in a very difficult situation at the time of the divorce. My husband always knew that I was not a woman like the others, so I didn't agree to their terms but they told me that if I didn't bring it up, my case wouldn't move forward. I tried to kill myself because I couldn't take it anymore, but my kids took me to the hospital. I gave up my therapy at Roosevelt Hospital. As you can see, this trans man at age of 13 years with two children cannot um, pass this process as simple as I, as I showed you. And he should bring his husband or his parents in his, uh, uh, processes. So this is one of the specificities of Iranian um, history of transgenders. So the next quote is, I want to remove my testicles by surgery and get a lawyer to change my documents. I can also do breast prosthesis, prosthesis surgery to feminize my body. The important thing is to stop being a man and look more like a woman. But I know that is not possible because I left my parents and they will refuse my request. I had a hard time. I was injured by my brother. My leg have been broken. I lost our studio again. We didn't have any home. Now it's better. I do business like, you know, the sex business. We earn our living and we keep the city alive. Shahro Abad Gardi. So for this um, uh, young trans woman who have left, don't have any parents to be there for her, uh, request. So she's an outsider. And the other um, question is this situation that is really vulnerable for her. She, she do sex working for, for gaining her living, so for, for, for living. But uh, uh, in this situation, she, she's completely outside of any recognition in, the, in Iran. And she's completely in a, in a situation of precarity. And what is the becoming of this person that identified her, herself as 
trans and she don't have any place in this protocol. So I suggest you to come back to Iran and work for us and be careful not to become the instrument of the West. I'm telling you the truth. Iran is the paradise of poor trans. There are no organization or charities to really help us despite all these tears can live in Iran. It's not oil that the Westerners can take away from us, but with human rights, they can influence and raise awareness in Iran. Be careful what you do and for whom you do this research because your analysis can be used to attack, the, to attack and criticize Iran once again. This was one of the very interesting quotes and one of the very interesting person that I've met because I've never heard the voice of these kinds of trans people in Iran. And uh, I think it was really a unique uh, voice. Masculinity, as I experience it, is different from that experience by another man. Likewise, femininity, as you experience it, is different from the experience by another woman. I create my masculinity in my way. It's not a copy, of, copy and paste of someone else, it's mine. So it's someone that has to quote a, a trans man and a actor and director of theater that I will uh, show you his voice and an activist in Iran. I'm never going to talk about this with anyone. I have no trans friend. I only stay in touch with natural women, women like you. So this kind of auto-censorship is really um, common uh, in trans people that I've met, not only in Iran, but also outside of Iran as asylum seekers. This, this form of auto-censorship and completely deleting all her past or his past is really one of the interesting points that I've met. So the last quotes, it's, um, I want to talk now about the form of resistance and I try to be um, on time. Um, I think that criticizing in a violent and angry way doesn't work in Iran. And this way of criticizing is even a little selfish because you have a criticized, you have to criticize someone who is on an equal footing with you, not someone who doesn't know the trans topic. I don't mean to say that I'm always passive and gentle. To defend myself, I also scream when necessary. People start to tolerate a trans in an atmosphere of mutual understanding and not in an argument. Some resist with, with anger and hatred, but it's not resistance. So for these trans women in Iran, if you want, if you want to uh, do some resistance, it isn't the same, uh, the same way that we can see in other societies, in Western societies, with, their, with, demanding, with asking a recognition in law it's more tolerate because you cannot be aggressive with someone, with a society that isn't enough um, sensibilizing. They, they, they don't know enough what is trans and what is trans issues. So cyber activism is one of the most important place for trans people to identify themselves. Not, not, not this uh, cyber activism is not uh, only political, but by um, telling their stories, their everyday life is a form of uh, resistance against this invisibilization of, of uh, trans people as an identity and only one and one uh, single identity. So here is someone else too that I uh, thank him a lot because I learned a lot from him. Someone is an actor. He was, uh, he did his transition in 2007 and he was the personage, the first uh, bodyguard as a woman in, in the in Iranian cinema. Uh, but what he do as activist in Iran is that he proposed some kind of theater therapy. This theater therapy was first start for himself to, to do a therapy for himself. And, uh, but not only for, for uh, he, he don't uh, uh, just, uh, he, sorry, his histories is her, her uh, individual histories, but for other peoples that join him in his workshop. What he do as a methodology and method in his works is that uh, he invite, for example, trans people or their parents to go on the stage and talk directly to public and talk about their everyday lives. Sometimes he, he use some real trans person as a personage and this person in his theater that there isn't any fourth wall, they go to the public and ask them to, read, to put, for example, red nail polish on hair or put some lipsticks on hair. And this is the strategies to facing people with this shame to accepting some identities, some identities that they are not uh, for them normal. 
he put some, so he put a scarf, for example, to men, to audience before uh, starting of his piece, and he challenged this person to, to how it how it could be feel when you don't belong to a gender representation and you should put it uh, in your body. Or he asked, for example, uh, the audience to put uh, to put on his breast bandage that most of mm, trans men do, and uh, this is maybe is a final slide and is that when one hand holds him back and bears his veil, the other hand comes to help him. Thank you so much for your attention. <laughs> Thank you very, very much, Bahar John, <clears throat> for your brilliant presentation. Um, so more than one speaker has said that the complete uh, references that we put don't seem to come up. Please, at the end, uh, Aki is going to put everyone's emails, as I said before, into the chat. So you're welcome to directly get in touch with our speakers. Our final speaker for today is Shekhufa Behbahani. She holds an MA degree in comparative literature from the University of Amsterdam and is currently part of the Amsterdam School for Cultural Analysis, where in 2020, she started conducting her PhD research into screened, unscreened, narratives, non-normative gender, and sexuality in contemporary Iran. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm very happy um, to be here today and definitely enjoyed all the presentations. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. So um, my uh, research is titled Unscreened Narratives, Non-Normative Gender and Sexuality in Contemporary Iran, as uh, Roya John uh, said. Uh, I want to say that I'm at the very beginning of my research and as much as I would have wanted to share more outcomes and results, uh, unfortunately, I have to um, stick to um, my approach more. And hopefully today I can uh, use the example of two films to show how perhaps films can be an opening for us to um, you know, look at the overlaps between nationality, gender, ethnicity, and, um, and sexuality. And in my research, I look at, uh, you know, a, a number of uh, contemporary films and performances, uh, also the works of uh, Salman Aristu that Bahar mentioned. Um, and I look for representations of, um, uh, of queerness and non-normativity. And I use this term as an umbrella term uh, referring to uh, what is established outside of uh, the heterosexual, heteronormative uh, codes within the society. And um, comparing and contrasting these films together with the political religious discourses uh, that was uh, brought up a little bit. And I try to see then what is the space for uh, queerness in, in contemporary Iran, given the dialogue that uh, somehow is beginning uh, to, to um, start with uh, a cinematic artistic discourse and this political religious um, discourse. So um, when we talk about um, queer representations in Iranian cinema, of course, we have to remember the, uh, the censorship that all films uh, have to uh, go through. So uh, we end up with uh, films that feature a trans uh, protagonist, because of course, as explained, this identity is, is more recognized compared to other forms of identification. And, uh, and you have uh, these films who that, on a, um, on a um, you know, on a, on a certain level, they, uh, they are aligned with the dominant political religious discourses that mandate, uh, you know, medically transitioning to the other uh, binary uh, sex. And um, at the same time, some of them, you see that they sort of criticize, they find a way to criticize um, the, the, the frameworks around, uh, around this legalization. And these are just some of the examples that you might have uh, come across. Um, 
we also have films that are a little bit more rare, I would say, and they bring up the topic of queer desire. So um, you have, for example, in Invasion and a little bit more directly, but in the acid, uh, the risk of acid drain, you have uh, a less indirect way of uh, talking about queer desires, queer feelings. And of course, probably uh, it starts with Daughters of the Sun by uh, Mariam Shahriari in, two, in the year 2000. And of course, there are other films that I have not included because it's a short time, uh, but mostly there are series, uh, TV series and films that uh, sometimes, uh, you know, um, contribute to the stigmatization um, when it comes to queer and trans um, individuals rather than uh, criticize. So I haven't included um, those, but if uh, uh, we uh, want to talk about it in the q a it would be great um so the films that i do want to talk about today are offside and cold sweat uh, specifically because they revolve around the issue of of football and the stadiums so just uh, to kind of uh, maybe remind you if you have watched them or tell you if you haven't watched them, Cold Sweat tells the story of one particular female protagonist, the captain of uh, the Iranian football team, the female football team. It's a fiction film, uh, Afruz Ardestani, who uh, wants to leave the country and go and attend an international match, but she can't because her husband has uh, uh, basically disallowed her uh, from leaving the country. And this, of course, uh, rings a bell to so many of us. Uh, many Iranian athletes have been in her shoes. Uh, an example is Nilofar um, Erdalan. And on the other hand, we have Offside uh, that tells the story of not the football players, but the football fans who, uh, of course, because of the ban imposed on uh, female sports spectatorship, cannot go to the stadium and have to do that uh, as disguised uh, uh, as, as men, like many uh, women do, and I'm sure the stories are are familiar. And um, so on the surface, again, these two films, uh, you know, one of them criticizes the passport law um, and, and the other one criticizes the ban. And I'd like to show how perhaps they, they can do a little bit more than these uh, criticisms. So I mentioned that I, I chose them because they, revolve, uh, they uh, revolve around football and stadiums. And of course, that's important because uh, stadiums uh, and football, they're political spaces, political sports. That's where the national identity begins to exist and be reflected and created. And uh, when we look at the case of Iran, if, if you can see uh, the photo, I don't know how clear it is, um, you can see names of the 12 Imams, you can see religious symbolism, and this is the Azadi Stadium, uh, and that's um, Khamenei giving uh, an hour long speech to the besiege force. Uh, so this already, this image uh, gives an idea of why stadiums are important, but also they're important because executions happen in, in stadiums. In smaller cities, executions um, uh, happen. And at the same time, um, of course, together with the gender segregation that I talked about, the, the stadium kind of uh, represents and reflects this uh, paternalistic, patriarchal, male-dominated and, and violent, uh, violent space. It's interesting also to know that it also reflects uh, some other issues, uh, such as the marginalization of different ethnicities. Um, for example, in the year 2018, there was a match between uh, Persepolis from, uh, from Tehran and uh, Teraktor Sazi from Tabriz. And what happened was that the number of seats allocated to the fans of Teraktor Sazi were uh, fewer than those uh, uh, allocated to the fans of um, Purse police. And so this kind of already reflects the marginalization of this ethnic group, but also um, th that it started a conflict, right? The, the fans of uh, Tractor Sazi started to uh, cross the boundary and, and to occupy um, the same number of seats and sort of be entitled to the same uh, safety and the same um, space. Um, so basically, the whole point is that uh, the stadiums are uh, key to establishing this uh, Persian Shi'i identity. 
And so I want to just uh, draw on the work of Ali Ansari here, uh, who writes in his book titled The Politics of Nationalism in Modern um, Iran. He writes that um, the, this form of uh, nationalism, the Persian Shi'i nationalism, is not a new uh, nationalism after the revolution. It is merely a reinterpretation of the nationalism that already um, existed before the revolution. Um, but now it's with a focus on the, the, uh, the key role of the clergy in, in, uh, in building, in, uh, uh, building this um, national um, sentiment. And so uh, there, there, is, there are some overlaps then, right, between the Persian Shi nationalism and the nationalism that, uh, that has been there since the modernization process during the, the Pahlavi um, era. Uh, and those overlaps, uh, again, uh, can be mentioned the Persian uh, centrism, right? Uh, what uh, is also key in both forms of nationalism and has been extending uh, after, before the revolution and after the re revolution is, is the, the meaning and the symbolism of the female body, how it has been politicized back then by practices of devailing and after the re revolution by uh, the, uh, the mandatory um, hijab. So um, I just want you to have all this in, in your mind before we go to uh, the, um, the films. So basically, um, the questions that I'd like to address, the questions I think these films can, uh, can help us think about, because I think we don't think about these questions as much when we talk about uh, LGBT uh, issues, um, is that what are the overlaps between uh, these experiences, the experiences of uh, non-normative um, uh, individuals, uh, and, and uh, people from non-Persian communities. And so to go to um, the first film, so I told you that uh, in Cold Sweat, we have Afruz Ardestani who wants to leave the country. He, she has already this national sentiment of, of going and playing for her um, country, but she can't because of the passport law. So sub article three of article 18 and, um, um, and article 19 basically mandates for uh, a married woman to uh, have a written permission from uh, their husband, from her husband, to uh, apply and get uh, an Iranian passport. But also Article 19 uh, gives a permission to the husband to withdraw um, that initial um, uh, permission uh, at any time that he wants. So basically uh, a married woman uh, cannot rely on uh, on her passport because at any given moment it can be taken away from her and this is exactly what happens in the case of um, of a fruit so I want to just point out one one thing that is very interesting about cold sweat that from the start uh, the film gives us two opposite teams almost like football itself you have um two characters who uh identify or embody the persian Shi nationalism which we talked about with the the uh, entanglement of Shiism, religiosity, and, and the Persian centrism. And you have two other uh, characters, um, Afruz herself and, uh, and a team member, Masi, who stand in, in opposition to this Persian Shi nationalism. So those who embody this uh, uh, nationalism, the nationalism of the state, are uh, one of the characters you actually see in figure one, uh, the one who is wearing a black uh, chador, who is the supervisor of the team uh, called Mehrane. And the other one you see here, uh, this is Afruza's uh, husband, uh, Yasser. So these two um, sort of uh, get uh, closer together uh, when the film uh, gets a little bit um, further. And the reason why is that they discover that uh, Afruz hasn't been living with, uh, with Yasser, uh, with her husband for over a year. And instead she's been living with uh, Masi, her team member, uh, her teammate, and uh, possibly um, 
partner. Um, so this uh, realization um, basically takes away the opportunity from um, from uh, Afruz to ask the Federation to support her because the, this is possible that the Football Federation sends her as a national athlete rather than the husband take her captive as a, as a married woman. But it doesn't happen because the two are, are aligned with this uh, Persian Shi nationalism. And um, as much as she tries and, and uh, she gives in to all the requirements, um, it's, uh, it doesn't happen. And by all the requirements, uh, I want to draw your attention to uh, the figure two here. Um, she is asked to basically go back to her husband and give in to his request and have sex uh, in order to persuade him to give this permission. Um, and as you see here, uh, she is in the kitchen, a domesticated uh, environment, and he uh, is gazing upon her uh, within that, uh, you know, social um, uh, role and gender norm. Um, and this is uh, basically before he, um, again, denies that right um, from her. So I want you to remember this kind of dynamic as we go to um, offside. And offside is, is interesting because um, it was shot during the, uh, the match uh, uh, that was taking place at the Azadi Stadium in 2006, a World Cup qualifying match. So pretty important. And at the same time, there were um, open uh, stadium uh, campaign ad advocates um, uh, outside of the stadium. So it's a very socially relevant um, uh, film. And what happens here that again, you have uh, authority figures against uh, a protagonist. But what's interesting is that this authority figure is a little bit different from that authority figure that we had there. Because with Afruz and, um, and Mehrane here, both of them are Persian speaking um, women. And then here you have um, a, a guard, a soldier who is uh, from uh, Azerbaijan, who is from uh, Tabriz, uh, with a group of uh, female protagonists, unidentified, unlabeled, uh, uh, you know, uh, it's, uh, they can be queer women, they can be, um, uh, uh, by and, and so on. Um, so uh, the dynamic here is interesting because now this uh, authority figure is uh, male, but uh, he's not uh, Persian speaking. And this changes uh, the power relationship between the two um, characters. They start off as being sort of uh, opposite of each other. One is captive, the other one is uh, is policing them and then they talk and realize that they share some experiences and the, the shared experience is exactly because of the patriarchy and the Persian centrism within this national um, national space. Um, if uh, the the protagonist uh, played by Shaiste Irani uh, she uh, decides to, you know, challenge the gender norms and gender roles as, as she has uh, done by, uh, you know, uh, ignoring the ban and entering the, the stadium. Then uh, she is seen as, as a traitor like uh, Afruz. She is seen as someone who is uh, no longer part of this uh, national space. And if uh, the soldier from Azerbaijan wants to um, not submit to this Persian centrism. He is seen as a separationist. He is seen again as someone who does not belong to this um, national space. So I want to just draw your attention to this uh, shot here, uh, which happens sort of after this connection is made between these two um, characters. And you'll see um, the soldier from Azerbaijan looking at these um, uh, women with an X, again, because unidentified. Um, and as they are rejoicing uh, after Iwan has scored a goal, even though he doesn't feel that sense of uh, identification with Iran, and we realize in the film that he identifies more with the city he comes from rather than Iran, 
he sort of connects with them and, and he starts to sympathize and understand um, their, uh, their struggles and their lives. And it's interesting to, to see this, I think, in contradiction uh, with uh, Cold Sweat, when this is an objectifying gaze in uh, you know, a domesticated environment, this is a newly discovered gaze, uh, which has uh, a lot of uh, potential, I would say. But then reaching my, uh, my conclusion here, I have to maybe comment on that uh, potential a little bit. Um, the, the film Offside ends on a, I would say, on an idealistic uh, note. If you've watched it, it's, uh, you know, it's an amazing shot of everyone being in, uh, in the bus. They are being taken to the uh, police station, but they're also listening to the football match uh, on the radio. And what happens is that suddenly Iran wins the match. And um, again, this is shot at this, uh, on the same day. So um, the street gets busy, the bus has to stop, and then everyone you know, has to leave. There is no one cares about anyone's gender, anyone's sexuality. It's this kind of uh, opaque moment, more or less, um, when the uh, soldier from Azerbaijan and uh, the protagonist are all part of this uh, nation, as you can see in, in the photo. Um, but this moment is, is fragile. We realize this, this moment is not something that, that happens uh, often or is predictable. And on the other hand, we have Cold Sweat ending um, with Afrus being uh, alone in her car. She has lost uh, her job. She has lost her partner. Um, she has um, yeah, lost her house too. But yet uh, she doesn't give up completely. She calls the um, uh, a live uh, program and, and comments again on her uh, situation as she had done before um, and speaks up about her situation. So even though the two film kind of uh, end again with, with on different notes, but one thing they have in common, um, and that is that this, this struggle is, uh, hasn't ended and the protagonists uh, don't give up at the end, no matter how hard uh, it is. And um, yeah, this is, this is the, the note I want to end this with, um, that the struggle goes on. Thank you, thank you for listening. Thank you very, very much, guys. You managed to squeeze in a lot into a very short time, <clears throat> which brings me to another point, dear viewers. As we said, this is just a taster. Personally, I would have liked to have heard far more uh, from our speakers. So in due course, hopefully we'll have them come and speak to us a bit more. And also we've already lined up the second event for the LGBTQ Iran with an amazing speaker talking about classical Persian literature and uh, the uh, different characters that were non-gender normative, non-sexual normative, uh, the terminology people use. And um, so hopefully you'll join us for that. Now, meanwhile, I can see quite a few questions have come in. So I'm gonna just go through them one by one as they arrived, everyone. Actually, I'll go backwards. Um, uh, for a start, Paolo Rivetti says, thank you very much, Shukru, for very inspiring. Uh, Bawarjan, Malcolm Rakshan asks, have the effects of Khomeini's fatwa extended beyond the borders of Iran and into the broader and the global scope of Shia uh, jurisprudence, consciousness in spaces like Lebanon and Iraq? Um, thank you for this question. I think uh, if you're really interested in this uh, part, it means Sharia law and fiqh, I really recommend you the work of uh, Ali Pur that I mentioned uh, also, or the work of uh, uh, other um, researcher. But in my, uh, as I know, the, the fatwa of Khomeini was at the same time of the fatwa of Al Tantawi in Egypt. And uh, what have happened for Iran, it was really, I think it was really interesting, but to really answering your question, I should be 
more um, knowing about what happens in Shia, Tao, and what are really the difference. But I think that in Lebanon, uh, in 2016, uh, they have, with request of one trans man, they have kind of legalizing uh, this request for sexual reassignment surgery. But all the time, I think in Lebanon, also in Iraq, the question of trans people is completely psychiatric in a psychiatric assessment, and you should surely pass by uh, a mandatory uh, sterilization and sexual re reconstruction, I, I think is the one of the most important. It means that in a Muslim country, you cannot change your identity, your gender identity without um, deleting the adjectives that it's in your body as male or females. You should so do a sterilization and then reconstruct your body in a completely in a binary form. So this is my information about your question, but I think that the fatwa of Khomeini was uh, surely influenced to other uh, mujtahed or other uh, religious authorities in Shia thought. But as I mentioned every time, this is a fatwa spe especially for Iranian uh, society. And it's uh, this kind of, um, I think it, it's really, it's not a Shia thought, it not, it's not Islam in a big, uh, um, perception is really little and little and little and very specializing. Wonderful. Thank you for that, Bahar John. Um, now we're going to, I'm going to go backwards. And it's, it's amazing. There's different questions coming in. Um, I'm going to go on to a question that was asked from uh, Zainab. How, Zainab John, how do you think new changes to internet censorship are likely to affect the LGBTQ community in Iran? Yeah, um, I think censorship has been all, almost always there and uh, people have always found uh, their way to express themselves and to access information. Uh, after so many years is of using uh, different uh, anti-filter softwares and VPNs, uh, people already know how to uh, go around it. And I think uh, it's not a big issue for people, but uh, they are more concerned about their security because people have been arrested for what they have been uh, doing on social media. It has not been limited to LGBT community, but also to other people who don't follow uh, the norms, including uh, sexual norms. So I'm more concerned about how uh, it will impact on everyday uh, life of people, but also people know how to protect their identity, how to hide themselves. So I think people know how to live in uh, this kind of uh, context. Thank you very much. Uh, Baharajan, there's another question for you about self-misidentification. People who might find it easier or more convenient to identify as transsexual, even though they may not be, but they only have a hard time adjusting in a society as a feminine man, for example, without necessarily having gender dysphoria. So misidentification, Baharajan, how does one... Okay, um, mis self misidentification or self uh, misrecognition so. yes it's um, yes it can happen in iranian society like anywhere anywhere else in any any other in every society that a trans person should pass by a, a protocol by a medical legal protocol maybe um, or surely in countries that um, homosexuality is criminalizing and any other uh, gender identity as non-binary is criminalizing. So these kinds of misrecognition or self-misidentification can happen. But if I want to be more uh, specialized, talking about Iranian society, if a trans person identify him or herself as trans, but he's not, what, what could be convenient for this person? Okay, she or she can go to this protocol and uh, 
if successfully can pass the, the, the hours of therapy and diagnostic and she, she's diagnostic as TS or trans, she just have two years. And then she, she should undergoing sexual reassignment surgery. So if this person really find this situation uh, and it's complete violence against her real identity, I think it's not as easy as we think that she can pass this protocol. What I, I, didn't, um, I didn't have time to talk about is that when we talk in outside Iran, there is a very cliche uh, image about trans people in Iran because they are Muslims, because they, they are in a Republic Islamic and because homosexuality is criminalizing. So all trans people are people that they are gay or lesbians, that they are going to, uh, they are undergoing sexual reassignment surgery by force. And this kind of, um, I think in this imagination about trans people, it's really invisibilizing you. We, are, we, we don't see a real trans that like anywhere else in the world can, can really want to change her body or want to go to this protocol. And inside Iran, we, we find another discourses, which is also um, victimize, victim, victimizing and also invisibilizing. It means that in Iran, we just have one and one and only one trans identity. And this person is surely in binary and surely suffer from this situation and surely wish to undergoing sexual reassignment surgery and surely want to reconstruct sexual organ. But we have a lot of different identities that these, these identities are completely outsiders of Iranian uh, protocol. So yes, it can happen, but I don't think that this person can find really this uh, because if I compare my research from um, other academician, for example, Afsan Najmobadi uh, uh, and uh, other um, uh, researcher, uh, it was really interesting that in Iran, uh, based on this fatwa, you can have the, the authority for sexual reassignment surgery. And it wasn't limited. You have this authority. Once you have this authority, you can live uh, in an opposite gender. And then, for example, after five years, six years, you can undergo sexual reassignment surgery. And but recently, when I when I did my research, it's just two years. It means that if you don't change your body in two years, it's finished, and you should restart. And I think this changing is because of the influence of Western medias. Western medias that. They, they, they produce a lot this image of Iranian trans person that they are, obli they are obligatory to do this sexual assignment surgery. I think one of the, one of the effect of all of these documentaries that show just one and only one identity as a trans in Iran is that they react to them because they want to show that, no, it's not as easy as you think that everybody can be trans in Iran. So this is my answer to your question. Thank you very much, Baharajan. Uh, Shukovajan, there's a question for you. Do you, in your research, also look at films that are mostly made outside of Iran that seem to be quite marketable and produce a particular image of queer and trans people in Iran by tapping into who nationalist discourses? How do you put the films that you discuss in conversation with the ones that the, uh, that Seema uh, Shah Sari has mentioned. Yeah, this is a very interesting and important question that I had to ask myself at the beginning of my research, and I kind of made the conscious uh, choice of not really going deep into uh, the films, fiction films, and uh, also, of course, documentaries that have been produced outside of Iran. Um, because um, I feel there is a gap or there is a lack of, uh, you know, academic uh, sources when it comes to films that have been produced in Iran. And what I noticed is this increase in Iranian films within Iran since the early 2000s, as I mentioned. And at the same time, there was this uh, increase in uh, the number of uh, you know, sources by uh, Karimina and others on the political religious discourses. So my interest is really um, bringing uh, this uh, or sort of shedding light on this interaction. But of course, uh, as part of the, the wider uh, discourse, um, these Iranian films 
inside Iran uh, also interact uh, with the films outside of the, uh, the country. Um, I would say that um, there is a wide range of, range of films outside of the country. You have uh, films like uh, Circumstances or Circumstance, which for me personally was really difficult to watch. I don't know if you've watched it with a lot of, uh, you know, it's, it imagines a world that is not uh, real and, you know, a different Iran kind of. And, and uh, you know, it has this Western um, gaze uh, of what two uh, Iranian lesbians are supposed to <laughs> look like. Uh, you have other films like uh, I Am uh, Nasrina, for example, which I think is, uh, is interesting because it looks at um, specifically the, the case of two asylum uh, seekers, Iranian asylum seekers. Um, but yeah, it's a wide range uh, of films. It would be difficult to um, to categorize them. Um, and definitely I would somehow write something on, on those films as well, but I wouldn't be able to, to go deeper into that. I hope that answers uh, the question. Uh, guys, we've got Asal Bahadi asking everybody. So should we will go in terms of Baha, Shukufa, Zena. Do you know how the cinema and theater or TV shows in Iran show the evolution of LGBTQ? The cinema, theater, and TV, how we can see an evolution of LGBTQ in Iran. So should we start with Baharjan and then go okay, to- Okay, I think Shukufe can better than me talk about this subject, but as I talk about Saman Arastu, and I, I don't know if he is here and if he can join us. Someone, what someone did in theater and in his performance, it was, I think someone is the only person that talk about uh, not only trans people, but all other, all other non-binary, non-heterosexual uh, non, uh, people in his pieces. But as trans people and transgender identities legalized in Iran, and as he himself is trans, so he challenged people about, uh, about this question. And um, I think in cinema, I'm not really uh, specializing and I let Shukufe to answer you, but in theater, I think in theater, I think someone was, someone tried a lot to inform people about uh, by question. It means by, as an open opening question about transgender situation in Iran, he opens a lot of other questions um, to public like for example, how to facing this shame when he asked public and audience to put nails on a man's body, it, it's, a, it's a sense of shame to facing your shameness about this representation and this diversity. So I let Shukufe to continue. Um, yeah, I also want to mention that my uh, focus, I'm not a film critic as well. Uh, I do cultural analysis. So I look at these films as cultural um, objects, but to comment maybe from my personal um, observation with, with the films that have been coming up, I can tell that uh, there is more uh, representation, but then again, what kind of representation um, is it? I've been thinking of this one uh, film, probably some of you know it, it's um, uh, it's a new film, but uh, I forgot the title, uh, but there is a protagonist uh, um, and she says she's, uh, she's a trans, I mean, he, um, uh, trans protagonist, and he basically says that I am sick, I need sex reassignment surgery. Um, and so there, there is this, uh, I would say, um, different, there, there is a uh, different ways of uh, uh, bringing up this topic, but there are always those representations that add to the stigmatization and that that have uh, trans characters, uh, you know, uh, in a way, reduce the trans uh, character to someone who just wears uh, clothes assigned to uh, the other uh, binary gender, and so on. So I think it's not a uh, how do you say, it's not a linear um, uh, uh, kind of uh, evolution as it's represented uh, in the films. You always have films that go a little bit deeper, try to criticize a little bit more, and, and films that just, uh, yeah, stay in the surface. 
Zainab John, have you got anything to say about films? Well, I'm not uh, an expert when it comes to movies, but I think something that is important to consider, not only about uh, films in Iran, but also any cultural products anywhere else, is that one thing is that how uh, characters are represented, and one other thing is that how we interpret them as audiences uh, and also as critics. Uh, and I think it's very important to consider when we see same-sex attraction, it doesn't uh, necessarily mean that we are seeing uh, a gay or lesbian character, especially when we have seen that character uh, who has been in love with the other sex as well. Uh, so um, it is very common to say that uh, for example, this character who is living with this woman is, uh, and uh, she identify as a woman as well, is a lesbian, and uh, then uh, think that, okay, she has been forced to marry that man, or she has never been interested in that man, uh, and or she has been trying to uh, live like heterosexual people, uh, and uh, because in Iran, we never really directly can talk about same-sex sexual attraction in cinema, then uh, of course we never know how the characters identify, but we have the same problem in uh, cinema in Hollywood, for example. Uh, we often see people who are engaged in uh, sex with more than one sex or character, uh, one sex or gender, but we almost never hear the word bisexual, pansexual, or queer. We always assume that anyone who is with their same sex are lesbian and gay. Uh, if I may here interject, because I've been doing some studies on Iranian film music. So I've been watching films for the past 60 years. And one thing I noticed prior to the revolution, I don't know if people are aware, but in Iran, we have something called the Luti these sort of men who were the big men of the city. And there are real uh, gay narratives within that. And I found that the characters that I would encounter in these films would be the gay characters, would be rather effeminate gay characters, sort of men who are slightly effeminate, but there was a real sense that there was something gay going on within this storyline. We were never shown it. And then I find that as I watch films post uh, 1979, and especially after the 2000s, you are actually getting more nuanced characters. It's never out in the open, but there are far more characters that could be associated with the LGBT community in a bit more rounded way before it really was the Luti downtown Iranian macho man who had a male counterpart who was always effeminate. Now, a question I have here from Mr. Uh, Ms., uh, from Najd Al Ali, from all of you, for all of you. Thank you for everyone for very interesting inter interventions. I wonder how you straddle the difficult challenge of advocating for LGBTQ issues and rights in relation to Iran and the Iranian diaspora in context of the extremely precarious political situation in terms of sanctions and the threat of war. It came up just once in a quote by Bahar, but I assume, Naj Ali Ali says, it's relevant to all of you. So what does an intersectional political position mean for you and how you maneuver the highly polarized Iranian diaspora? We'll start with you, uh, Zainab John, because it's on you. Yeah, this is very important. As I mentioned, the, in, uh, the international context has a huge impact on the way that we think and talk about sexual orientation. And uh, also more specifically in the context of asylum, it's very important the way that uh, case officers often from Western countries expect uh, asylum seekers to uh, behave based on their stereotypes that they have about who is a real gay and that real gay is a middle class uh, 
a white uh, man uh, who has a specific uh, open lifestyle and go to a specific places. This is uh, very important and also uh, it's very important how uh, in diaspora a lot of activists uh, think that they can uh, uh, choose what should be the priority of everyone and uh, often uh, minority right is silenced because of the uh, what is considered to be the more important political uh, issues that people are encouraged to uh, stay silent and uh, don't criticize because uh, West can uh, misuse it or uh, Iranian regime can, can misuse it that women are not uh, supposed to talk about hijab because it disturbed the uh, way that Western media uh, talk about Iran uh, or I don't know uh, it, that same sex uh, sexual conduct is not as important as uh, uh, issue of political prisoners. Uh, this makes uh, talking about minority issue very hard because uh, we are not considered as important as uh, men, uh, especially uh, from dominant uh, ethnicity who are talking about the most important political issues. Okay. Bahar John, have you got anything to say about uh, this whole? I think Shukufa uh, answered very well, but uh, this is really, these stereotypes, uh, as I told you, uh, I face it a lot. It means that when I, when, I, when I was in Iran for my research, every person that I met in institutions told me, why you do this research, you are not in Iran. You are doing re this research for whom, for which organization? It means that I'm as a researcher, I'm there and I want to stole the information of trans people or Iranian as a national information to them to hear. And here I faced also other peoples that they wanted me to, to more and more politicize my question and to, to be more as a political activist instead of as a sociologist or as a researcher. And it was really interesting for me and these quotes that I think another person also mentioned in questions that uh, directly asked me, it means that when I started the interview with this person, that was really unique because she was really happy to be in Iran and she was really grateful to Ayatollah Khomeini's fatwa. And I've never heard the voice of this person. That, because I said uniqueness because I've, I've never heard in documentaries, in books, in works, in research, the, the voice of these kinds of trans people that they are in Iran. And she asked me why you do this research. Uh, you, you shouldn't do it because you are not in Iran. And uh, it was really interesting for me and it shows that how the the politics outside Iran, the discourses outside of Iran about trans subject is really in a stereotype forms. Iranian Islamic uh, trans person, what, what, what could it be? And uh, directly they put the uh, criminalization of homosexuality. And this is how, that's why I put pressure to that. These are both the discourse that invisibilize this uh, multiple form of identification and subjectification in Iranian society. And it was a challenge for me to be neutral, to be uh, uh, to do my research as a researcher and to critic. And even if it's political, I critic, I critic it and uh, to not be only as an activist who just critic the system and the discourse, but what trans people also believes and uh, they share with us. That's really good, actually, because that in a roundabout way answers a question of Shandis about this idea of the unique voice. Shukubijan, have you got anything to say about this political situation and how it impacts your studies? Yeah, just a quick comment, because, of course, my research is less uh, related, uh, I mean, less um, dependent on actual uh, individuals and more working with the films. But I still find it uh, challenging to find uh, platforms. I mean, this is a great opportunity 
but usually the the platforms or the opportunity uh, given um, uh, given to us oftentimes are you know um, as as mentioned. It, we were put in a situation where we have to use a lot of disclaimers. This is not what I'm saying. This is not what I'm saying because there is so many stereotypes and so many prejudgments that first all your effort goes to kind of undoing that. And then maybe you get to uh, bring up um, a certain um, topic. And uh, yeah, again, I agree with uh, Zainab and Bahar that this isn't, uh, a topic, it's not a luxury uh, topic. We're talking about actual human beings uh, who, you know, ha come from a, a particular uh, ethnicities, uh, social classes, and all these films represent those that, uh, those characters that are visible to some extent, but there are uh, queer individuals, there are uh, working class uh, women and, and trans men who are, as uh, as Zainab said, uh, you know, it's untellable stories, really. So we're dealing with an unjust system. We're uh, we're dealing with this uh, fight for for changing things, um, not only for for queer people, but uh, changing things for the better. Wonderful. Uh, this is an interesting question because this whole idea we started off with the idea of language and nomoculture and the problems we have in translating different concepts to different countries with their own notions. Persian Disciple asks, as a non-binary person, I haven't found a satisfying word for non-binary in my native language, Farsi. So our three researchers, have you got any uh, suggestions for such a term? Have we even found such a term? So should we start with you, Shukufajan, and then we'll go to Zainab and Bahar. Oh. I think Zainab uh, and Bahar. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. So should we take Zainab and Bahar? To, uh, Zainab, John, Aval, have you come up with it? Have you come across a term? Well, as a non-binary person, I use Jensiata uh, Reira Dogane, which is a like direct translation, and some people have already used that for almost two years now. And uh, some people are not happy with that. And still they use non-binary because as I said, people tend to use English terminologies in the uh, Persian uh, speaking LGBT communities. For example, I was told by my interviewees that they have never met anyone who used Dojen Skera. They always say bisexual. And uh, I think people don't learn uh, my research also shows that, that people don't learn uh, terminologies and concepts from Persian speaking activists like us. They learn it directly from uh, English uh, pop culture and also English uh, social media. And it's one of the reasons that they are not interested to use the uh, Persian words that we create for ourselves and we fight over it. If uh, and always we challenge each other if they are good translation or not. We are the only one who are concerned about these translations. And Baharjan, anything to say on the matter? Mm, no, I think it's complete. Wonderful. Now guys, I think this is a really interesting question. How do this, your researchers feed into the whole feminist debate in contemporary Iran? Are there any specific contestations that transpire? And that's from Sabiha Alush. So we'll start with Bahar, then we'll go Zainab Shukufa. Go on, Bahar. John. Unfortunately, uh, what I, uh, uh, I, I can say that in Iran, the feminist discourses in Iran, they don't talk about trans people. And there isn't any, uh, maybe I'm wrong, I, you can't correct me, but uh, I didn't find any feminist in Iran that talk about trans people, that criticize their, their issues, their, their situation, and they, they add, uh, add them, not just add them because they are not there to add other peoples as women, but they don't talk about, for example, the issues that a trans woman facing in everyday lives. I didn't find anything in, uh, inside uh, feminism in Iran, and outside feminism, there is a different 
form of feminist. Some feminists are radical feminists and all the time, for example, that I talk about trans women as women and uh, I add them to my presentation when I'm talking about women for, for 8th of March or other days, they criticize me. But some feminists are more um, open and they add uh, so the, the issues of trans people also in their discourses. But general, generally, I think that what is the difference uh, that we can find in Iranian society comparing other societies that have that have a very great progress. It was because of feminists that really criticizing these pathological discourses about trans people. But in Iran, unfortunately, I didn't find really too much working in the discourse. Okay, Zainab Jan, anything feminist thoughts? How it's affected? Uh, well, that's a very important issue. And I think we need to talk about it more in, uh, Persian speaking communities. I actually talked about it um, in a annual feminist conference, uh, which is for mostly for diaspora activists, but also some activists from Iran managed to join it every year. That uh, in Iran, it is very hard to talk about sexual orientation and even gender identity in feminist movement because of the uh, pressure from the government and also because of the uh, stereotypes that uh, society has, but uh, even uh, abroad, women, feminist activists who have lived here for several decades, they still don't talk about these issues that much. They still talk about uh, gender and sex in the binary of men and women. They still uh, don't think about sexual orientation that much. They don't even educate themselves to be able to talk about it correctly. They don't really care about it. But there are also activists who are identify as queer activists or in their intersectional understanding of feminism, they um, consider sexual orientation and gender identity. And also inside the LGBTQ movement, there are people who self-identify as feminists and uh, they understand how feminism is important in their uh, fight for uh, equality based on sexual orientation and gender identity, and not only among uh, people who identify as uh, women or uh, non-binary, but also among uh, people who identify as men as gay, bisexual men, or uh, trans men. So I think we can have hope for the future, but at the moment, yeah, uh, this is an issue that has not been uh, taken into account that much. Thank you for that. Shukovajan, anything to add? Um, I, I agree completely. I just want to um, mention that I, I think what Bahar explained this, uh, you know, the, the legalization of sex reassignment uh, surgery in Iran is, is itself important for, you know, women's rights uh, issues related to, uh, related to that context, because of course, that legalization has happened within this mapping of gender and sexuality. So it becomes interesting when you look at, you go a little bit deeper and you see, uh, you know, uh, for example, if uh, uh, a heterosexual couple, uh, both of them transition and they have a kid, uh, which one becomes the father uh, legally? And I think if I'm not mistaken, Bahar, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, legally the trans uh, woman uh, becomes, uh, is still the father of, of the child. Uh, why the uh, the trans man who was the mother uh, doesn't have the same authority. And I think that says something about, you know, this uh, paternal, um, uh, yeah, the, 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 the whole family structure and the, the importance of being a father and uh, that authority. But so issues like this, I think, can can be really, really essential to both kinds of research, but I don't see that in uh, in the research uh, community that I'm I'm in touch with, unfortunately, yeah. Thank you for that. Uh, I was informed just now there's been a brilliant play written by Sanaz Bayan called Blue Pink about trans experiences in Iran. I found a very interesting question about the COI because I think we should use some of this technical knowledge we have here. Um, Zainab John, 
how do you think that the COI available to asylum caseworkers adequately reflect the situation that LGBTQ and people face in Iran with enough detail enabling the caseworker to take the right decision? So how do you think the situation is, the COI? First of all, uh, I think it's important to consider that no country of origin information document can ever be complete uh, because these are only uh, documents uh, that are produced either by human rights organizations like Human Rights Watch or by embassies and other uh, governmental and non-governmental organizations. And uh, even if they get updated uh, regularly, even if they uh, consider different gender identity and sexual orientation that they don't do that, they uh, still are only documents and no one can really assess anyone's else sexual orientation and gender identity especially when they are from another context especially when they are in a context like asylum hold the idea of uh, checking if someone is telling the uh, truth or not in the asylum process is not really acceptable and should be challenged but uh, it's important to see that uh, all the country of origin uh, information documents are mostly about gay men. They rarely uh, consider other groups of uh, people in the uh, LGBTQ communities. Doesn't matter by whom they have been produced or for which country, there is almost never anything about uh, bisexuals in those documents. Okay. Um, we have a question here from Vali, Salam Vali John. Um, Bahar, uh, and it's a question for everyone, but uh, thanks to everyone, he says, for the great presentations. Bahar, how do you differentiate self-identification where individual human beings identify and express themselves in particular and individual ways and the paradigm of rights issues, legal rights, state-sanctioned violence, or state-sanctioned recognition and protection of the rights and well-being of the individuals and groups by law. So how do we make these two meet? Um, I think, as I mentioned in my work, there is surely self-identification. It's not something coming from the person as a subject without uh, influence of anything else. There is discourses, there is religious discourse, love, family, love, everything. And this was in the, in the lawyers that I show you in gender normativity. So not as trans or not trans, we are all constructed in these processes of um, what, it, what we can see, it's interactive. It's interactive and it's not just outside of us outside of us that create this self identification i think it's a both side and if your question is that how in this situation that other discourses like love like uh, um uh, anything that it's in society is important for a trans person that that i said as a self identification i think that gender transition starts by a self identification when a trans person is, is still a child, she, she or he starts to affirm this identification that he or she feels. And it's uh, in face of her family or his family and, and then a school and then bigger and bigger and bigger. And all the time, this is a process. So identity for uh, in my thought and from the philosophical thoughts that I'm inspired by, identity is all the time a process. It's a process and one part as Rico said, it's a idem as we can find in a word of identity is idem, it means the same. So we are, we are the same parents, we are the color of our eyes that it's, it, will, it will stay one thing forever, but it's the, the other parts of identity that is in, in a perpetual, uh, if I say it like that in English, I don't know, but in French, we said in, in perpetual construction and identity is all the time in a process of um, construction. So all the time I think all the discourses 
uh, is important, but trans people, um, they are not, we can, we can find an agency in Iranian trans people. It means that they are not all the time uh, forced to, to identify themselves as trans, because I showed you, it is not as, e as easy as we can imagine, but surely there are some form of invisibilization and there are some uh, trans people that they become the outsiders of uh, this uh, protocol, for example, in Iran. So for me, identity and self-identification is a process. It's an, in, all the time in an interactive way uh, between subject and society. Now, one thing, uh, um, Akijan, someone at us too has actually put their hand up. I wonder if there's any way that we can bring someone uh, into the panel. Please, uh, can we check into that? Because Saman is a very important character within Iran. So, yep, thank you, Akijan. So, Saman, you're going to be coming online soon, I believe. Um, we should take, uh, I wonder where Saman is. Uh, oh, there we go. Saman Jan, Hasdin Shoma. Salam, Bale Hassan. Bah, 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 Khosh Amadin. Saman Jan, be English, you can speak about it or Farsi, and you can speak about it. متاسفم انگلیسیم خوب نیست خیلی خوش آمدید This is someone Arastu who Bahar Azadi spoke about He's one of the most important trans characters within Iran Whose uh, presence is very important Saman جان چیز خاصی داری برای ما امروز بگین؟ بله من خیلی علکن متفجه صحبت های بچه ها شدم سلام می کنم به شکوفه عزیز و بهار عزیز و زینب عزیز و شما که این برنامه رو بپا کردید مرسی میخواستم بگم که تئاتر سینما و تلویزیون ما برای خوشایند گروهی کار میکنن نه برای هنر و نه برای مردم عرق سرد که شکوفه در مورد صحبت کردی آفساید نه تنها به همکسشال ها توجه نمیکنه یا به جنسیت ها بلکه خود, س... خود سینماش جنسیت زده است و بیشتر مرد سالاری در این دو فیلم حاکمه بخواستم بگم که کالب و چکافی که من کار کردم که بهار و شکوه صحبت کردن در مورد ترنس های همکسشوال و ترنس های بایسکشوال هم صحبت شد این بابت زینب جان بود که گفت که خیلی کم در مورد اینها صحبت میشه ولی ما یه جورای سانسور رو دور میزنیم و به قول معروف حرف بچه ها رو به زبان ساده به مردم میرسونیم دستشون درد نکنه uh, so, uh, basically, he thanked all the speakers, everybody for being here. Uh, he said that the theater, cinema, and television of Iran is for the good of some. It is not for the purpose of art and for the, largely speaking, everybody, the uh, the people. It's not for the peoples, it's just for Khoshai and it's just for the benefit of a few. Now, he also mentioned that the films that Shukufejan showed, the cold sweat and offside, there were no I will use his terms, he used the term homosexual, but I presume the word gay is preferable here. There are no gay representations uh, in the cinema. Whilst the cinema of Iran is highly gender ridden, it is much more of a patriarchal society. So in both these films, we see this male patriarchal society at play. And he also mentioned that the theater that he does, Karbucha Kofi, uh, about the trans, have within it gay trans and bisexual trans. And their idea is to get the story across to people in the simplest manner, in the language that everybody understands. Khairi merci, Saman Jan, chiz digay mi khayin shama begin? Merci, ma umid baram ke honar bedoun marz karish to anjam bede va joda az khat qirmez ha jolo bere. Mese dorani ke godar dar sansur kar kar و صداش رو به همه رسون میشه توی سانسور هم خیلی خوب حرف رو زد به شرط اینکه دغدغه سامسون جدید و سفرهای آنچنانی و فرش قرمز نداشته باشیم 
He's saying that let us have an art without borders to be able to reach beyond the red lines, like the time of Goddard, where within censorship, censorship one could still make art felt. Saman Jan, I hope that the time of the time we can be able LGBTQ Iran. I hope that we can be able to 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 Merci, Samanjan. Oh, what an honor to have had someone here with us. And hopefully in due course, someone is going to uh, provide some content for our program in due course. Khobacha, we have got five more minutes left. I don't know because they've been, I just want to make sure that everyone knows, please forgive us if we weren't able to ask your uh, questions. Um, and uh, there's another question for everybody. And I like this question because this has always been of interest to me because within Iran, many people know we had this uh, societal thing of and Aduni, Biruni, and we've had all this sort of, uh, as uh, very quite rightly, Malcolm Rakshan points out, we have a lot of homo social intimacies, which are very pronounced in the country. And I think ideas of homosexuality really came to us from the Western canon of ideas. In, Persia and in the East, we do have different ideas about third genders and so forth. So Bacha, the final question is, do you believe that the homosocial intimacies, which are pronounced and identifiable in Iranian society, have impacted or complicated queer imagery, narrative, and semiotics in cultural and aesthetic discourses? So Bahrajan will start with you. Are you in the middle of the day? 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 Yes, I, no, I understood the question. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I think the, the homo uh, erotism is, is part of queerness. Why they should, I, I didn't understand the question exactly. I mean that um, I think uh, the effect shouldn't be negative or it's inside queerness and inside the, how this person identify him or herself and without talking about the terms. Um, I don't know, maybe Zainab can answer better than me or Shukufe. But I don't find any um, um, difficulties for queerness or for, or for, I think it's a part of, the, of uh, this and uh, these terms, I, I I like these terms as homo eroticism because it's not um, in a modernization in a modernization form of science and psychiatric and it's really outside of all all of these discourses. Um, I th I think that the thing here was homo social intimacies because of the Islamic world separation of male and female. We have had sort of a long history of certain events happening between men and between women. He's saying this earlier idea or way of being in our country, in Persia, does that complicate issues or for you, no? It's part and parcel of the whole thing. I don't, I, I think that this idea about Iran or other Muslim countries that there is a very uh, huge uh, sexual segregation between uh, people, uh, is uh, one of the very uh, famous idea about people, but I don't, I don't think that it can really um, create the identity of a person. It can, in, and it's not only for Iran. I think in, even in outside of Iran, this form of relations between two sex can happen in the same, for, for, for someone can be just in, in uh, some day, some years of, uh, for example, in, when they are child or in adolescence, and then they can change, but it's not an identity. I don't, I don't believe that this um, identity is, as I, I, I told, I told the process, and it's inter in, in an interactive way. Uh, I don't, I, I don't think that that, that can determine a, a identity of person or so, sexual orientation of person. This context. Almost. Okay, Zainab John, Shukubi John, have you guys got anything to add about this homosexual sociality and how that affects the studies? Well, I think uh, same-sex sexual attraction has been existed in uh, different societies. It's not something unique about Iran or Middle East. 
but uh, we all know that uh, pathologization of same-sex sexual conduct is a, a modern new uh, discourse from 19th centuries. And as I said, um, it has been adopted in Iran as well. So there has been criminalization of same-sex sexual conduct even before the Islamic revolution in Iran. And that was an idea that was adopted from Western countries and also the idea of being able to uh, claim to cure uh, someone for their same-sex sexual attraction has been existed in Iran before the revolution as well. So I think uh, we have adopted a specific form of homophobia and biphobia and LGBT phobia from Western countries and also the idea of the a binary understanding of same uh, binary understanding of sexual orientation is also a new modern concept. Uh, thinking that everyone have to choose and be attracted only to one sex or gender. These are new things. And uh, I'm sure that you all know how uh, nationalist uh, modernists reacted to uh, these discourses and uh, tried to uh, modernize society by uh, encouraging people and also forcing people to be only with uh, the gender that is considered to be the opposite uh, sex or gender. Uh, and still people uh, have negative attitude towards same-sex sexual conduct because of that uh, modernist nationalist discourse. These are important things to uh, consider when we talk about uh, our history and when we uh, talk about sexual orientation and the impact of uh, Western discourses in understanding uh, sexual orientation. Brilliant. Shukrubejan, have you got anything to add? Okay. So ladies and gentlemen, that draws us to a close. And in a way, this whole thing about homosocial intimacies is a brilliant segue to our next program, because we will have a really amazing specialist talking about classical Persian literature and the presence of characters outside the non-binary gender sexual normative ideas. I hope you've enjoyed today and I hope that we get to have more talks like this because it's I, I for me, I got into all of this, I haven't got to know a little bit about the Iranian and Islamic LGBTQ. I began to realize how complex the issues are and how the conversation needs to increase. So please, you have all of our emails, get in touch, get in touch with me if you have any ideas, any books, any plays, anything that needs to be discussed under this umbrella term. So thank you very much to our speakers. Thanks a lot, guys. And I hope to have you guys back to do proper talks, proper full length talks. And Akijan, is there anything to add or are we done for today? Yes, I think it's all good. He's written, oh God, yes, God. Bacha, enjoy the day. Thank you everyone for sticking with us for such a long time. And uh, we'll wave a goodbye to everyone. Merci, merci, Hamegi. Merci, merci. Thank you. So Akijan, if you close the session. Thank you guys. Thank you everyone.